Hi, this is Jay Steven of Real Crusades History. A little while ago, I posted a video dealing with the fate of the Christian women of Jerusalem who could not be ransomed in 1187 when Saladin captured that city. And someone in the comments said, well, okay, but what did Christians, what did Crusaders do with Muslim captive women when they captured a city or won a battle or something like that? And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, so I'm going to do a little podcast sort of comparing uh, different instances of how Crusaders versus Saracens dealt with female captives or children captives or that kind of thing. So this will be kind of interesting. I'm going to go through several examples and I'm going to use some primary source accounts to give us some insights into, into those examples. So here we go. So first of all, just to give us some context, I'm going to go ahead and read the passage that the original video was based upon. So this is from Imad ad-Din, who was a secretary to first Nur ad-Din and then to Saladin himself. Uh, he was an eyewitness to a lot of Saladin's career, and he was one of our, um, well, he's one of our primary sources from the Islamic perspective for the Third Crusade. So this is Imad ad-Din talking about the aftermath of Saladin's capture of Jerusalem. In particular, he's talking about female captives and children captives who could not be ransomed and what happened to them. So this is Imad ad-Din. Women and children together came to 8,000 and were quickly divided up among us, bringing a smile to Muslim faces at their lamentations. How many well-guarded women were profaned, how many queens were ruled, and nubile girls married, and noble women given away, and miserly women forced to yield themselves, and women who had been kept hidden, stripped of their modesty, and serious women made ridiculous, and women kept in private, now set in public, and free women occupied, and precious ones used for hard work, and pretty things put to the test, and virgins dishonored, and proud women deflowered, and lovely women's red lips kissed, and dark women prostrated, and untamed ones tamed, and happy ones made to weep. How many noblemen took them as concubines, how many ardent men blazed for one of them, and celibates were satisfied by them and thirsty men sated by them, and turbulent men able to give vent to their passion. How many lovely women were the exclusive property of one man? How many great ladies were sold at low prices, and close ones set at a distance, and lofty ones abased, and savage ones captured, and those accustomed to thrones dragged down? So again, that's from Imad ad-Din. And interestingly, that author, Imad ad-Din, who was one of Saladin's closest uh, servants, um, he's actually portrayed in Kingdom of Heaven. Do you remember the Saracen lord who Balian meets when he first arrives in the Holy Land? Um, he meets this guy who pretends he's not the lord, and he ends up getting in a duel with the guy's servant, and then Balian eventually meets this, this uh, Saracen lord again in battle and realizes he's a great uh, emir. He's one of Saladin's uh, chief men. And then, of course, we see this, this same guy um, accompany Saladin throughout the Siege of Jerusalem and all that stuff. That character is actually Imad ad-Din. If you look at the credits at the end of the movie, uh, that's who he is named as. I don't think his name really comes up as being that important in the actual movie. He's kind of just, you know, there as you know, Saladin's right-hand man, but that's who, that's who this is, and that's actually um, who they're portraying in the movie, and this, and this author is who I just read to you, this is one of Saladin's uh, chief men, and he leaves us this account of what is done to the Christian women of Jerusalem who can't ransom themselves, and it's, it's, it's a very jarring account, um, especially, you know, if you're a, a modern person today, you read this, and it's, it's horrifying, um, a couple of things. There's this emphasis on the humiliation and subjugation of these women. These women are being laid low. They're being, um, 
you know, they're, they're humiliated, they're um, forced into degradation, they're being raped, they're being, you know, sexually exploited. And this is kind of celebrated as this sign of, of victory, Islamic victory over Christianity. And the reason that Imad al-Din is, is kind of celebrating this in this way is because within, you know, the Islamic religion, there's this idea that Muslim men can take non-Muslim women as sex slaves, basically, as concubines. Um, you know, this is a rel religiously sanctioned thing. Of course, in Islam, a Muslim woman is protected. You know, she's veiled. She has the protection of her Muslim uh, family members. But non-Muslim women are kind of fair game for Muslim men. And I mean, we just see this kind of laid out in, in the way Imad ad-Din is describing this. Concubinage is religiously sanctioned in Islam. Now, this is very different from Christianity. We don't really have a context in Christianity in which this could be sanctioned by the religion, if you will. Now, you know, perhaps there, there have been Christian military leaders or soldiers who have taken non-Christian women as captives and abused them and used them as sex slaves. You know, this very well uh, could have happened in history. But within a Christian religious framework and within a Christian society, there would have been no way to sanction this. Like, this would have been viewed as unacceptable. Um, just because there's, you know, in Christianity, there's this strong emphasis on sexual, um, this certain type of sexual morality in which a man can really only legitimately have sex with his wife. You know, sex before marriage isn't acceptable. Of course, there's no polygamy like there is in Islam. And, you know, there's there's no idea that like, oh, well, you know, if you're a, a Christian man, you can have non-Christian women as sex slaves or if you take them in captive in battle. I mean, it's just not it's just not a thing in Christianity. Now, having looked at that, I want to take a look at a passage from a Crusades chronicler uh, or from from a source uh, from the Christian side. And this is going to discuss how some uh, Muslim women who were captured by crusaders, by uh, Christian soldiers, were treated. And it's, it's, uh, it's just as jarring, but it's very different. So this is from Fulcair of Chartres. This is from his, uh, his famous chronicle, which documents the First Crusade and then the early years of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This is from Book One, um, and in the Francis Rita Ryan translation, it's on page 106. So this is actually a description of something that happened after the Battle of Antioch. Now, if you remember in the First Crusade, the Crusaders take Antioch, and after that they defeat Kerboga, this Turkish emir who comes to relieve, um, or not relieve, but he tries to retake Antioch immediately after the Crusaders had taken it. Now, the Crusaders fight Kerboga, and then they, they defeat him in this spectacular battle, and then they capture his camp because he his army flees you know when an army is kind of in an open disorderly flight like that there's no time to kind of pick up the camp so there's 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 a you know elaborate turkish camp left behind in the wake of Kerboga's flight and there were turkish women in that camp so we're going to look at how Fulcair of Chartres describes this this is Fulcair right here those turks who had good and swift horses escaped but the stragglers were abandoned to the Franks. Many of these, especially the Saracen footmen, were taken. On the other hand, few of our men were injured. In regard to the women found in the tents of the foe, the Franks did them no evil, but drove lances into their bellies. Okay, so that's... I'll never forget the first time I read that when I was early in my interest in the Crusades. I mean, it's just one of those passages that... You know, for a modern person reading a medieval chronicle, it leaps out at you. You're like, holy, I mean, it's, it's jarring, it's, it's disturbing. A couple of things that we can kind of tease out of this little passage. First of all, it's very brief. It's very, um, I guess, laconic would be the word. It doesn't really give us that much information. And I actually included the whole paragraph, which mostly does not talk about women captives. And I included that whole paragraph just to show you how kind of almost abrupt it is and how it, it, it sort of leaves us with a lot of questions. It doesn't really describe to us that much. 
Okay, but the fascinating thing, of course, about it is he says the Franks did them no evil, but they stuck lances in their bellies. Okay, so what what are you talking about? What do you mean you, you did them no evil? You, you killed them. You, you slaughtered these women. Uh, the evil that Fulcair is talking about, of course, is sexual defilement. And again, this kind of shows us a difference in the Christian religion versus the Muslim religion. In Christianity, sexual chastity demands that a man only engage in sexual activity with his wife. You know, he can't have premarital sex. He can't have sex with a woman he just captures in a Turkish camp, right? And that's what Fulcair is concerned about here. In particular, this is important because these are crusaders. These are men who have taken a religious vow and they can't commit you know, sit, a sexual sin. A sexual sin would be this, this horrible stain that would, you know, um, invalidate their vow. And so that's kind of what, I think that's what full care is, is emphasizing here. And, you know, this is kind of how I've always looked at it. You know, there may be some experts out there who can, who could, who would uh, take issue with, with the way I'm interpreting this. But, and if, if there are such experts out there who, happen to hear this podcast and you think I'm wrong about this, please let me know. But this is what I'm taking from this. Um, yeah, he's talking about rape here. Um, they didn't rape them. And it's interesting because, you know, on one hand, on the one hand, I think he's, he's saying that it would have been an evil thing to, to have been done to them. But also I think he's, I think he's more concerned though about what this would do to the souls of the crusaders. You know, if they were to, unleash their sexual passions on these women. I don't think it's so much the act of rape, forced sex, that is would be bothering full care here. I think it's more that these uh, crusaders would defile themselves, you know, in doing this. So he says, they did them no evil, but drove lances into their bellies. Again, it kind of leaves us um, unsure about, you know, what to make of this. Uh, I mean, obviously, there, there was Turkish women killed here. They were, they were slaughtered. You know, they were found in their tents, you know, cowering in fear, I'm sure, and they were murdered, you know. Um, but, you know, we don't really get much in front. I mean, the, the last passage I read, the passage from Imad ad-Din, is much more elaborate, right? It gives us a lot more detail. It tells us how many, you know. And, of course, it does go into this long kind of poetic litany of, uh, you know, gloating over... Um, the abuse of these women. But for Fulcair's passage, it's very short, and it, it, leaves, it leaves us with questions, right? Was this done to all the women found there in the camp? Um, you know, is this just... I mean, obviously, Fulcair couldn't be everywhere. Uh, is this just what he saw done to the women he happened to see captured? Could it be that there were crusaders who did capture some Turkish women that day and maybe keep them? And, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But I do think it, it's, it's noteworthy because it shows us a different attitude, you know, and it, within these two societies, the Islamic world of the medieval era and uh, the Christian world, there were different sexual mores, different, different attitudes, because these are both, uh, you know, literate men. They're well-educated in their, in their religious traditions. Uh, full care is a priest, He's a clergyman. So again, a lot of times, especially in the 11th century, there weren't, you know, later on, we're going to get um, more secular people in, from Christendom writing stuff. Like, you know, in the 13th century, we've got chronicles written by crusaders themselves. And we do have one, uh, the Gesta Francorum, which, which appears to have possibly been written by a knight. But, you know, we don't know much about his identity. But for full care of Chartreau, he's a clergyman. So he's giving us kind of a religious interpretation of this. And again, this is a, a vague passage in a lot of ways. Um, I have never found another passage like it in descriptions of uh, Crusader victories by Crusader chroniclers. It's not like this was some sort of standard practice where, oh, okay, so we, we win a battle, and if we find some Turkish women or some Muslim women in the tents, if we capture the camp, you just kill them. That's what we do. I mean, that's, that's really not... Uh, that's not the case. I mean, we certainly can't say that. There were plenty of times when this sort of thing was not done. Um, in many sieges, for example, where the Crusaders captured a Muslim city and they came to terms with the ruler of that city, the citizens of that city would be allowed to go free with their lives. That, of course, includes the women and children. 
And uh, we also do have examples of uh, crusaders ransoming um, uh, female captives, female Muslim captives as well. So and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that later. But before I do, I do want to give one other example that actually names women specifically. And that is also from the Chronicle of Full Care of Chartres. And this is from the fall of Jerusalem in 1099. When the Crusaders capture Jerusalem in 1099, what happens to a lot of the Muslim population of Jerusalem? Well, as we know, a lot of them were killed. So this is from... Well, this is an account of what happened on the Temple Mount, which is, that's one of the areas where some of the bulk of the killing actually took place. A lot of the Muslims who had fled there ended up being, being killed in, in, the, in the melee, in the, in the chaos of the final moments of the sacking of the city. So this is from Full Care of Chartres. He says, Many of the Saracens who had climbed to the top of the Temple of Solomon in their flight were shot to death with arrows and fell headlong from the roof. Nearly 10,000 were beheaded in the temple. If you had been there, your feet would have been stained to the ankles in the blood of the slain. What shall I say? None of them were left alive. Neither women nor children were spared. So, um, a couple of things to look at with this. First of all, of course, the number 10,000 is exaggerated. I mean, that would have been an enormously huge number of people for the medieval era. That certainly is just an exaggeration of the number of people who could have been even physically gathered on the Temple Mount like that. I mean, and of course, you know, this idea of blood standing up to the ankles. I mean, we, we've already talked in previous uh, videos and discussions about how, you know, this is uh, medieval hyperbole. You know, oh, it's just tons of people and there's blood everywhere. That's more what we're, we're looking at here. Now, of course, we have uh, similar things um, from the Muslim side, too, we have examples of uh, Muslim Saracen armies engaging in slaughter and the massacre of populations of cities when they capture a Christian city. Uh, one example of that is actually before the First Crusade, the Armenian city of Ani. In 1064, it was sacked by a Seljuk Turkish army under Alp Arslan, and there is a description of that sack and the results by a Muslim chronicler named Sibit Ibn al-Jazi. And I'm going to go ahead and read his description of this. So this is, uh, this is our chronicler here. The army entered the city, massacred its inhabitants, pillaged and burned it, leaving it in ruins and taking prisoner all those who remained alive. The dead bodies were so many that they blocked the streets one could not go anywhere without stepping over them, and the number of prisoners was not less than 50,000 souls. I was determined to enter the city and see the destruction with my own eyes. I tried to find a street in which I would not have to walk over the corpses, but that was impossible. So again, uh, there's definitely some medieval hyperbole in here, you know, 50,000 people captured. I mean, that seems exaggerated. Um, the idea that every street was so completely blocked with bodies that, you know, you, you can't walk in. I mean, that's, you know, hyperbole also. But the point is, a ton of people are killed, a ton of people massacred. You know, the, the, the population of the city, you know, men, women, and children slaughtered. So, so this is just kind of an example. You know, this kind of thing happened on both sides. It was kind of the tradition in medieval warfare that if... If a city resisted you to, to the end, you would put the city to the sack and there would be some massacring. There would be, you know, widespread looting and, you know, rape and pillage and all that kind of thing. And, you know, both Christian and Muslim armies um, engaged in this behavior at times. Another example, of course, from the Muslim side would be um, a lot of Baybar's uh, campaigns when he was uh, conquering... Uh, various crusader strongholds in the late 13th century. I mean, you know, he put a lot of cities to the sack as well. Now, I want to turn to an example from Saladin, actually. Uh, Saladin was not above uh, executing Christian women himself at times. So, this is um, from Baha ad-Din. Uh, Baha ad-Din, of course, is the famous chronicler who wrote a biography of Saladin, which you can now purchase in translation called A Rare and Excellent History of Saladin uh, from Ashgate Press. It's a very, very good volume. I recommend it. 
So Baha ad-Din was one of Saladin's closest associates, one of his servants, um, someone who was with him a lot of the time during the action of the Third Crusade. So this is um, the execution of a group of Frankish travelers, including a woman, by Saladin. Uh, this is during the march from Accra. So like uh, while the Crusaders uh, were marching, uh, they had left Accra and they were on their way toward Jaffa. And this actually takes place before the Battle of Arsuf. So this is uh, Baha ad-Din. Saladin performed his ablutions and prayed before being brought 14 Franks and a Frankish woman taken captive with them, who was the daughter of a distinguished knight. With her was a Muslim captive whom she had received. The Sultan freed the Muslim woman and the rest he herded into the armory. They had been brought from Beirut, having been captured in a very numerous traveling party. They were put to death. Now, this is actually kind of an interesting passage. Not so much, I mean, obviously, you know, you know, Saladin's executing these people, these, these helpless captives, uh, and there's a woman among them. He, he kills this, this Frankish woman. But also it's kind of interesting, this, this point of the Muslim captive. So this Frankish woman had a Muslim captive with her, this Muslim woman. You know, we have this issue of, okay, in the Muslim world, there was a slave economy. Like, you know, slaves were held, they were, you know, used for all sorts of different purposes. Whereas in Western Europe, there really wasn't a system of slavery. You know, we had the feudal system. Christians in Western Europe, for the most part, did not hold slaves. Uh, now, there's a couple of places where this seems to have, there seems to have been an exception to this. Uh, for example, a Spain and Italy. And this seems to be because these were Christian societies that were kind of in close contact with Islamic societies, and some of those institutions kind of bled over. So, for example, I know in the 11th century, we had some uh, Christian kings in, uh, you know, in Spain uh, who had some Muslim female concubines. You know, if you read, uh, there's actually an interesting book called The World of El Cid, which is a compilation of four primary sources from medieval Iberia from kind of that 10th, late 10th century into the early 12th century period. And there, there are some mentions in there of some Christian kings who had uh, some female uh, Muslim concubines. So anyway, kind of interesting. But there's, there's always been kind of a question of to what extent did this exist, even, you know, in these Christian societies that bordered um, Muslim societies. Um, you know, the assumption seems to be that it was kind of a mirror image of, you know, okay, well, you know, in the Muslim world, they had Christian slaves and uh, in among uh, the Christians of, you know, of, of these societies, they had Muslim slaves. Uh, this almost kind of seems to be a little bit of a uh, glimpse at that. I mean, was this Frankish woman, did she have a, a Muslim uh, slave woman who was an attendant to her? Is that what this is saying here? I mean, it's not really that clear. Again, it's, uh, you know, one of those things, there's always many questions that come up when you are ex examining and delving into medieval chronicles. Um, oftentimes, they're more brief in what they say than what we would like, but it's an interesting question. Is that what that, that's saying? I'm not sure. Maybe. Now, the next story I'm going to read is another one about Saladin, and it's also from Baha ad-Din. And this is just to kind of contrast that last one. This is actually one of the most famous stories of Saladin's uh, generosity. The story of the infant restored to its Christian mother. Again, this is from Baha ad-Din. And Baha ad-Din actually specifically says he witnessed this event. Um, it does kind of have the flavor of almost like a biographical sort of uh, praise of a, a ruler's virtue. Oh, look how compassionate he was. But... You know, Baha Din specifically seems to say he was there. So, you know, did this happen? Did something like this happen? Uh, I don't know, um, but we'll take a look at it. So this is during the Siege of Accra. And again, this is from Baha Din, and he writes, The Muslims had thieves who would enter the enemy's tents, steal from them, even taking individuals, and then make their way back to the Muslim camp. It came about that one night they took an unweaned infant, three months old. They brought it to the sultan's tent and offered it to him. 
Everything they took they used to offer to him, and he would reward and recompense them. When the mother missed the child, she spent the whole duration of the night pleading for help with loud lamentations. Her case came to the notice of their princes. He's talking about the, the leaders of the Frankish army there. Who said to her, He has a merciful heart. We give you permission to go to him. Go and ask him for the child, and he will restore it to you. So she went out to ask the Muslim advance guard for assistance, telling them of her troubles through a dragoman who translated for her. A dragoman would be um, sort of an interpreter type of person. They did not detain her, but sent her to the sultan. She came to him when he was riding on the Tel al Karuba with me and a great crowd attending upon him. She wept copious tears and besmirched her face with soil. After he had asked about her case, and it had been explained, he had compassion for her, and with tears in his eyes, he ordered the infant to be brought to him. People went and found that it had been sold in the market. The sultan ordered the purchase price to be paid to the purchaser, and the child taken from him. He himself stayed where he had halted until the infant was produced and then handed over to the woman who took it, wept mightily, and hugged it to her bosom, while people watched and wept also. I was standing there amongst the gathering. She suckled the child for a while, and then, on the orders of the sultan, she was taken on horseback and restored to their camp with the infant. So this is a very famous story about Saladin. And it's, it's a very uh, moving one and compelling story. You know, there were some Muslim rulers like Zengi, for example, or Baybars, who were kind of fanatical in their desire to, you know, kill Christians and to humiliate them and just, you know, go all out whenever, whenever possible. Saladin was frequently not like that. He was much more given towards diplomacy, toward dealing with a situation in a way that would prompt his enemies to do what he wanted. For example... Uh, after the Battle of Hattin, when he was conquering all these castles and cities in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, frequently what he would do when he first got there was just say, look, if everybody just leaves the, the city or the castle, they'll get safe passage out of here, you know, men, women, and children. You can go to a Frankish-held territory and, um, you know, I'll give you safe passage. You know, generous terms to a, um, especially, you know, giving the the uh, circumstance that Saladin really didn't have any Christian army in the vicinity that was opposing him. Now, of course, this was standard practice. Uh, Christian rulers did the same thing. They would offer generous terms to a city because, you know, nobody wants to spend a bunch of time and money and effort and lives, you know, your soldiers' lives, engaged in a lengthy siege. Sieges were incredibly difficult, costly, and, you know, time-consuming affairs, so it's a lot better if you can just get the garrison to surrender. Now, I feel like I would want to leave it to a more of an expert in this particular text to, to tell us exactly what this, this uh, incident is telling us or what we can, we can uh, say, you know, historically about this incident. I mean, is, this, is there some element of praise of the subject of the book here? Uh, certainly, that's there. Um, you know, how, how certain can we be that this incident actually happened? Um, you know, what does it tell us? You know, is, is this may be, uh, there are quite a few things in Bahadine that are kind of like genre specific for these Muslim uh, chronicles that praise a, the virtues of a particular ruler. But there's also a lot of stuff in Bahadine that is absolutely very valuable historically. Um, it's, it's our best account of the Third Crusade from the Muslim perspective by far. Um, very good historical information in it. It's, in fact, it's, it's, definitely one of our best accounts of the Third Crusade period. I mean, it's it's a precious historical document. But, you know, and could this be telling us something about Saladin's character? Um, you know, does this tell us something about his compassion as a ruler? It very well may. It very well may. But then again, you know, we know he could be very harsh as well. I mean, you know, we just read an example where he executed a Frankish woman. And of course, you know, the, the first uh, passage we had from this uh, podcast was the description of what Saladin allowed to happen to thousands of Christian women who could not buy their way out of uh, sex slavery. So 
So yeah, uh, you know, medieval history is, is complex. Now, as I'm closing out this podcast, I want to read a couple examples of uh, crusader kings uh, or crusader armies giving generous terms to uh, Muslims when they were defeated. Uh, because, you know, just like with Saladin, you know, he was willing to, um, to give generous terms to uh, Christian fortresses that surrendered to him. Crusader kings were the same way. Now, I'm going to read a particular example that I think is specifically interesting because it describes terms given to a city after a long siege already. Um, this is the Siege of Tyre, which took place in 1124. By 1124, the Crusaders held pretty much all of the coastal cities in Palestine. You know, Acre, Beirut, Sidon, um, Arsuf, Caesarea. The Kingdom of Jerusalem held these cities already. Tyre was the last one to hold out. The only other one was Ascalon, way in the south. But Tyre was the only one kind of there... Um, on the Palestinian coast that had held out. And in 1124, it was conquered. And it was conquered um, by a coalition effort from the Venetians, who were on crusade and provided naval support for it. They provided the ships to blockade the, um, the harbor. And um, a coalition army made up of uh, the Count of Tripoli, Count Pons of Tripoli, and um, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which was under the control of the Patriarch Varmund, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and um, the Constable, William Burris. Uh, the king was not present because this, at this time he was actually in captivity. He was being held by Balak in, uh, in um, uh, the north. So he was not present at this time. And actually, for those of you who have read my novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage?, this incident appears in my novel. So this, the Siege of Tyre is a big part of my, my novel, uh, Why Does the Heathen Rage? So, but yeah, it's interesting because look at the terms that the Crusaders give to the Muslims, even after they have exerted a lot of effort in besieging the city. And also, the city was pretty much inevitably going to fall to them anyway. Um, if they had held out a little longer, they, they, you know, there would have been no terms. They would have just taken over and the Muslims inside could have done nothing about it. So this is from William of Tyre. He writes, The king of, D the king of Damascus, that's Toktekin, who's was actually the emir of Damascus, now sent wise and discreet men as envoys to the chiefs of our army, namely the patriarch, the doge of Venice, the count of Tripoli, William Burris, and the other lords of the realm. They bore proposals of peace, couched in conciliatory language. After much discussion and many disputes, an agreement was reached between the two parties. The city would be surrendered to the Christians on condition that those citizens who wished be allowed to depart freely with their wives and children and all their substance, that's their property, while those who preferred to remain at Tyre should be granted permission to do so and their home and possession guaranteed them. So that's from William of Tyre. That's from volume two. Uh, page 19. So these are very, very generous terms. Again, the Crusaders had already spent a lot of time besieging the city. They had undermined it to the point that it was likely going to fall to them. And they'd also defeated Toktekin in a battle. Toktekin had attempted to relieve the city, and the Crusaders had gone out to meet him, and they defeated him in battle. So, and what they give the citizens are, they give them freedom to depart, you know, men, women, and children, and they can take all their property with them. You know, that's pretty good. Um, you know, usually in this sort of situation, the most you can hope for is you can leave with your lives and you can't take anything with you because, you know, we're going to take all the property. But they get to take their property. And uh, there's no ransom. So these are actually better than the terms that Saladin gave to Jerusalem in 1187. You know, he required a ransom for the people to leave after he'd spent time besieging the city. This was a normal thing. You know, once you'd spent time and effort and money and blood besieging a city, you weren't willing to just let people just walk out and take all their stuff with them. It's like, okay, well, no, you have made trouble for us, so we're going we're gonna to own you. You know, we're going to take all of you as captives and sell you on the slave market and take all your stuff. Um, 
that's not what was done here. So these are very generous terms. Um, incidentally, Baldwin the first of Jerusalem, who uh, did most of the conquering of the cities, uh, you know, he was the first uh, king of Jerusalem in name. He he frequently gave generous terms to Muslim cities that that surrendered to him. Uh, he did the same thing with Acre. The citizens of Acre were were allowed to just to take their stuff and leave. He did um, sack uh, cities that resisted him, like Caesarea, for example. But when but when they didn't give him any uh, resistance, he he gave them very generous terms. So so this this w went both ways, you know. Uh, Christian and Muslim rulers both behaved this way, really. All right, so that brings me to my final little example here, in my discussion of the taking of captives in the era of the Crusades. So this is actually we're going to go back to 1104 now. Um, all right, so. In 1104, there was a very important battle that took place in northern Syria, in which the Principality of Antioch under Bohemond and Tancred, and the County of Edessa under Baldwin II of Edessa, those two armies um, were defeated at Haran by a coalition force of uh, uh, Turks, uh, Seljuks, and Ortigids. So yeah, there was a defeat. The this. Crusader army was defeated, and uh, Baldwin II of Edessa ended up be being taken prisoner. And when he was taken prisoner, Tancred actually went to Edessa to lead the defense of that city, because after that defeat, the Turks decided they were going to try to capture Edessa. But Tancred set up a very capable defense, and when one of the Turks, who had uh, been part of the victory at Haran, Jikir Mish, arrived with his army, he besieged Edessa. But in the middle of the night, Tancred, who had found out that the um, Turkish camp was poorly guarded, Tancred and a group of Armenians and Franks snuck into the Turkish camp, killed everybody pretty much, killed all the, the Turkish warriors. Um, some of them escaped. Jirkirmesh was able to escape and basically took control of the entire camp. They captured the entire camp. In that camp, there were some high-ranking Turks, including, um, we are told in particular, a noblewoman, a Turkish noblewoman who was a very high-ranking member of Jikarmish's household. Now, Jikarmish wanted this woman returned to him so badly that he offered Tancred 15,000 bizons to do it. You know, 15,000 bizons if, uh, if she would be returned to, to him. And Tancred accepted this, and the woman was ransomed. So, yeah, I mean, this is kind of interesting. This is very different, isn't it, from what we saw with um, with uh, Fulcare's account of, um, you know, what happened during the First Crusade when the uh, Turkish camp was taken after the Battle of, of Antioch. The First Crusade was a bit more of a dramatic affair, whereas the Crusaders, once they kind of settled into local politics, they were a lot more inclined towards this sort of uh, diplomacy, um, you know, the ransoming of captives, that kind of thing. Although we do know there was plenty of examples of captives being ransomed um, during the First Crusade as well. Um, uh, you know, Raymond IV of Toulouse famously ransomed um, some of the high-ranking uh, Fatima nobility who had um, sequestered themselves in the Tower of David after the fall of Jerusalem in 1099. So, you know, this did happen. So anyway... That's it. That's that's my little uh, look at um, the taking of captives um, from both the Crusader and Saracen perspective uh, during this this period of history. Uh, very interesting, you know. As as you can see, um, a lot of questions to still be explored. There's no easy um, one size fits all rule here at all necessarily. There's a whole variety of situations, and um, but you know, one thing I think we can say is that. Um, you know, there, there were times when, um, when Muslims and Crusaders engaged in, in massacres. There were times when they engaged in uh, very sober diplomacy. Uh, there was the ransoming of captives. Uh, this was a very normal part of, uh, of medieval warfare. So I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast. Uh, again, my name is J. Stephen Roberts, and this is Real Crusades History. If you go to realcrusadeshistory.com, you will um, find our blog in which we post regular articles, uh, mainly from Dr. Helena Schroeder, 
um, who is a member of the Real Crusades History team. She posts, posts a lot of great articles there, and also I post our videos and podcasts there. So if you go there and make that a regular place you visit, you will get all of our content. Um, also, don't forget to pick up a copy of my historical novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage? It's a novel set during the reign of King Baldwin II of Jerusalem. And uh, it's, it's a work of historical fiction that uses um, real historical sources to create a, um, a compelling story. So that's one way to kind of delve into uh, Crusades history in an interesting and entertaining way. So uh, you'll find a link to my novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage, in the uh, information box below this podcast. Um, also, please do support us on Patreon. If you support Real Crusades History on Patreon, if you pledge at least $5 a month, you will get access to exclusive content that is not available anywhere else. It's only available to patrons. And there will be a link to our Patreon also in the information box below this video. Um, and also I'd like to say thanks to our latest supporter on Patreon, whose name is, quote, some guy. So that's his, his handle. Some guy just pledged five dollars uh, so thank you very much some guy we appreciate that so thanks again for listening again realcrusadeshistory.com thanks <laughs>